Speaking tonight is going to be Professor John Clock. He's going to be doing planting seeds. Um, yeah, everybody can see that in their program. And uh, without further ado, I'd like to hear. Um, Then uh, everything is kind of uh, second class here, so um, this is the meatball presentation. <laughs> and, um, anyway, this is I'm just talking about uh, what I did in Afghanistan as an agricultural development officer with USA from uh, the years 2011 to 2012 uh, in Kunar province. Um, so I'm just going to give you a perspective on that, uh, mainly from uh, the the development world, okay, kind of the things that I did in my small postage stamp uh, world of Afghanistan. There was, there was thousands of civilians over there and uh, thousands of, of military there. So, um, one of the things that uh, I was responsible for in, in uh, Kunar province uh, along the Pakistan border was to try to build agricultural capacity, um, try to uh, monitor as best I could uh, agricultural project projects, and try to uh, build relationships between the Afghans, the uh, uh, USAID, which was my employer, US Agency for International Development, uh, the State Department, which was active on the ground uh, at the district level, uh, the PRT, otherwise known as the Provincial Reconstruction Team, um, and the Army. Um, so, when we talk about development, what is actually that? What does development mean? What, uh, we've been in this country for 13 years. What, are our, uh, what exactly are we doing? I can't, can't even uh, come close to approaching that topic. But I can tell you from the, the, the ground community level, uh, one of the things that we try to do is do no harm when you're out uh, and implementing projects on the ground. Uh, you're trying to work your way out of a job. That is, you don't want to build projects. You want to uh, build capacity. Um, you want to use appropriate technology. A lot of the things that we've tried in the country uh, were inappropriate technology. Uh, among those, uh, a very high-tech science nation coming into a subsistence subsistence assistance agricultural country. Um, you want to always have your counterpart, Afghan community, uh, give something back in return for what they're receiving. That is, either labor, you want to have them uh, uh, um, do the planning, of course. And too often, when we get caught up into the, uh, the big worst scenario, for lack of uh, other words, we forget that. Um, you want to do very thorough uh, due diligence in the field. Um, let's see. <coughs> and the next one. Okay, so I was located, I worked over here in Kunar province. Um, it was a great experience. I enjoyed it very much. I would have liked to stay there longer. Uh, we at one, one point had 400 uh, United States Agency for International Development officers in the field, now there's next to zero. So that's just uh, how things have taken place uh, over the last few years. I was part of something called the Civilian Surge, where we put a lot of civilians out there. I'm sure lots of you, uh, many people in here have been to Afghanistan, and I'm sure uh, you've met civilians out there <coughs> doing their work out in the field. Uh, I specifically worked in a very small district called Nurgul, which was probably in Kunar province, uh, home to many uh, valleys, home to many uh, uh, battles. Uh, this was the safest of all the, the districts, I would say. Um, so I was privileged to work with uh, and uh, assigned at a combat outpost um, uh, in Kunar province. So uh, my, my daily work schedule was three to five times a week going down to the district center in Nurgul. Uh, uh, once again, monitoring projects. Um, I lived and slept and worked with, it was embedded with a uh, uh, army uh, company. And I was 
uh, worked and went out to the field with the 3rd platoon from both the 25th the Infantry Snap Division no. when they were there and then uh, they rotated out and it was the 2nd ID from Fort Carson that came in and they were my escorts when I went out to the field. Uh, so 20 kilometers each way, I lived in a, uh, a district like actually no. further away. Um, Uh, this is kind of what it looked like. We had a, a river over the past 30 plus years. Um, agricultural capacity was greatly diminished in uh, Afghanistan. Um, the irrigation canals were destroyed. There wasn't a whole lot going on uh, agriculturally wise during the Taliban period after 1996. And so one of the, the urgent and crucial points was to rebuild agri agriculture because agriculture maintains 75% of the population. So without that, uh, your counterinsurgency efforts, your efforts to build good rapport on the ground, your efforts to uh, rebuild the country uh, can't take place uh, without agriculture. So my agricultural background, I went there and um, uh, uh, quite honestly, we, everybody there did the best they could under the situations that they could. Uh, so this is what it looks like if you ever get a chance to fly over Kunar province. You see a Kunar River which originates in Pakistan. It actually flows through Kunar hits the uh, Kabul River and then flows back out of Afghanistan, back into Pakistan. Um, along the way, that river is harnessed for irrigation and uh, quite literally hundreds of millions of dollars were spent on irrigation projects both in Kunar and around the country. So one of my projects, uh, one of my jobs was to get out and monitor these projects as best I could and of course you can think about all the ways a project can go wrong, all the ways uh, uh, it can happen wrongly if you're not out there on the field taking a look at it and monitoring the projects. Um, so uh, that's what I did. Another thing I, I did was I, I helped, if you, if you think back to the United States, in, in, if you're from a county, you will have an agricultural extension service. Well, Afghanistan didn't have an ag agricultural extension service. That is that extension agent that goes out to the field, delivers seeds. So one of the things that we were working on was to, to develop the, the ag extension or the district agricultural officer position. And uh, that was uh, done as well. And um, I'll explain that a little bit, the results of that. So, uh, in a <laughs> Tell me, mute their mic. Um, anyway, I'll continue on. Uh, if you're going out to the field, how do you know that you're getting anything done? How do you know that you are successful? You build a project in 2006, how do you know if that project's still there? You went out and built a well in 2007. How do you know if that well is still being maintained? You went out in 2008 and you uh, delivered money for a uh, economic development project. What exactly happened when you developed that little store on the corner? And that is uh, probably the biggest criticism of my organization that uh, there wasn't enough monitoring and evaluation afterwards. So I, I, for this presentation, which by the way, First time I was able to talk, uh, present it, so I'm very grateful that you're all here uh, listening to me, give my uh, worm's eye view of the world. Uh, but one of the things that we were looking for were basic services being provided by the Afghan government agencies. Uh, uh, were budgets transferred from Kabul to the province and then down to the district? One of the things you need as a functional, which was really looked at by every agency, if I looked at the looking at by the uh, army, by looking at the State Department, is, is if, you're, if you're giving money at the national level through the national budget, is that money making it down to uh, the district level? So we were very, very interested in trying to see whether our ag officers and our uh, uh, 
all of our officers in our district were getting getting paid and whether that money was making it down because if it wasn't you can't have a functional government right of course uh, we've all heard horror stories about Afghan corruption and uh, uh, they're legendary so you have to live with uh, and try to define what degree of corruption you're going to work with um, most importantly, do the Afghans feel that the government is working, district government is working for them? If they do feel it's working for them, and they feel like it's not something that's just a waste of time for them, that the, gov the government officers at the district level are taking all the development aid and running away with it, but if they do feel that they're getting some health care, some agriculture, uh, some seeds, some women are getting projects, um, education, schools are being built. If they do uh, receive the benefits of that, then uh, <clears throat> they're more less likely to support uh, the bad guys to counter the, the insurgency. So some of the, the priorities, I think one of the big ones was wheat production. It's a country uh, that is uh, full of uh, illicit crops. That is, Afghanistan is still producing 97% of the world's opium. Uh, so how do you compete with that? You really don't. After 13 years, we haven't even made a dent in it. Uh, but we did find that uh, the wheat seed that uh, was there was uh, largely had poor germination. And so some of the wheat that was developed was not GMO wheat, but uh, it was uh, <coughs> Uh, improved wheat varieties to increase production so that now you could possibly get uh, two dollars for a kilo of wheat um, still doesn't compete with a hundred dollars per kilo of opium but it's something that to improve productivity nonetheless okay um, the other thing that we uh, done, ha had done across the country uh, everywhere was improve opportunities for women and I would say uh, you know one of the easiest projects to do is to provide a hen for women working at home but uh, millions and millions of dollars were spent for economic development for women women's projects as well agriculture I can only speak to agriculture I can't speak in, in the other areas uh, uh, oddly, in my one year in Nurgal province, I never saw one woman. I was out to the district center a lot. Uh, it was a very traditional uh, community, and I was never uh, allowed to see them except alongside the road working in the fields. Uh, so that was very interesting for me. Uh, I, I, I actually had a culture shock when I went to the U.S. Embassy and saw an Afghan woman. I didn't even know what, what they looked like prior to that, uh, being out in the dusty fields. Um, so that's that was the type of community that I was I was working in. Um, I also did a lot of stuff, including um, education projects in the field, uh, farmer demonstration projects. This is a broccoli project, so you can see the footprint that we put out. Uh, one of the things that. Uh, is difficult to do is if you're trying to get out to the field uh, you have to bring four MRAP armored vehicles with you so the the footprint on the landscape was very uh, very large um, I would have preferred to go out by myself but it, uh, the situation never uh, allowed that so we we started some projects I, I came in followed up on projects that were already in place and then went out quite a bit and enjoyed meeting the Afghans on their own, on their own turf. So, the scorecard, and I've got a few minutes left here. Uh, were the basic services being provided by the Afghan government agencies? That's a mixed. In the town where I worked, uh, yes, they were out there, but out in the rural areas, which essentially Afghanistan is really mostly rural farms. Uh, that was a mixed bag. Uh, were the budgets transferred from the national level down to the district level? Uh, not very well. People were not getting their budgets, not getting their paychecks, not getting uh, funding for uh, what they needed uh, outside of foreign 
um, supplied aid. And then where Afghans, did the Afghans feel that their district government was working for them? This was uh, now take into account this was 2012 and things on the ground changed very very quickly uh, and so uh, while there was an insurgency in this area it was a it wasn't one of the more critical parts of Kunar province and the people generally thought that the government was working for them so that was those were some of the indicators that we were looking for when we left um, and in fact I left and I tr we turned over the district back over to the Afghans and I was involved was involved in closing down two USA base, two USA offices. Uh, because at that time, we were pulling out. So, uh, some of the lessons learned from my point of view: um, Afghans are very right-brain, spiritual thinkers. So, I, I, I always thought you would unify the country with sports, uh, religion, culture, and imagery. Um, uh, we tend to get the idea that uh, we can bring lots and lots of science uh, into a linear uh, situation and change thinking, but um, in my opinion, uh, a, a different approach to development um, was uh, one of the things I learned. Um, building projects is an easy thing. It really is easy. You, we tend to think that you know putting a well out it's a feel-good thing. Building a school is a feel-good thing. Um, but we've done a lot of feel-good things in the country. Uh, what were the, the ultimate result was uh, maybe a lot of these projects were not maintained. Maybe they were uh, um, not needed, or maybe uh, they were a waste of money. Um, the really challenging thing was to build capacity. And those in the teaching field, and we have a lot of teachers in here, uh, know that uh, instruction is a part of building capacity. That is training, giving people the skills that they need. It's difficult, it's not visible, it's not sexy, it's not out on the front lines, but that's what really was, uh, uh, is where Afghanistan is headed, of capacity building. Okay. So, in terms of other, I, the, the topic uh, today was uh, planting seeds. Not planting seeds in, in the physical sense, yes, but what other types of seeds have we planted since uh, our U.S. presence, great presence, uh, has been there in this country uh, for these past years? Um, a vision for the country, rule of law, courts, health care, an idea that uh, there is something um, beyond tribalism, um, education and value of the human mind, this is a big one. Uh, educational statistics are, are important. 10.5 million students in school with 40% female as opposed to back in the Taliban period, 1.5 million with about 50,000. So that is a success story, and uh, I have read uh, recently, uh, we've all heard the horror stories about U.S. schools being built in Afghanistan, and then they were taken over or used for, you know, keeping their cows or things like that. Uh, but now I understand that um, there is a, even a growing need for, for more schools. So this is a positive thing, because if you uh, can educate the mind, then you can change uh, a lot of other things as well. And then um, a spirit of entrepreneurism, uh, that is uh, jobs are needed. Uh, in the district I work, practically 100% of the youth were unemployed. And a uh, youth definition in, in that district was anything anybody under 30. So uh, critical need for jobs, but uh, Still, 97% of the Afghan budget is driven by foreign aid. Um, so that tells you a lot about how the country is going in terms of developing businesses. It's still very much uh, a project of other countries. And so anyway, those are some of the, the seeds that were needed. So I, I thank the, the people that helped me out when I was on the ground. And uh, I think that's it. Next one.
Anybody have any questions? <coughs> Did you? <s> <coughs> I have a question. Uh, does the country of Afghanistan produce enough crops other than opium to sustain the, the population of the country? No, it doesn't. In fact, all of the wheat is, is imported mostly from Pakistan. Virtually most of the poultry, the wheat is imported and then it's milled. Even the flour is. It. So uh, if, you, if, we just, if you just looked at all of the things that came across the Khyber Pass into Afghanistan, all of the products, uh, you could become very self-sufficient is by just taking away the Pakistan in, Pakistani imports. Um, so yes, no, they're not. Uh, and one out of every three years is a drought. Um, yeah. A lot, a lot of issues. Can you uh, give us an idea as to when you arrived and, and if, if it had changed by the time you had left? The, the average person there, would they? Is there the commerce set up where they can actually go out there and purchase? some food using uh, notional currency? Or is everybody kind of fending for themselves, individual families, you know, raising their own crops? And it makes sense, I think the, the long-term push, and, and you could probably speak to this if there was any of the drive towards this, is to get people, you know, collectively farming and then uh, sp spending less time as an individual or as an individual family farming so that they can then focus on something else, building business or uh, getting educated. Uh, as to the first question, yeah, uh, the, in Kunar they don't use Afghanis. Afghani is the currency they use rupees, which are Pakistani. That is the currency of choice. Um, and you can go out and buy a lot of stuff. Um, in the provincial capital of Asadabad, uh, there was always a kind of a, a neutral, uh, that was kind of a neutral capital where people really didn't fight too much. They, people both sides could come in and buy the stuff that they wanted to buy and then go back out and fight. Um, although that changed a little. As ter in terms of collective farming, um, uh, US Aid Agency for International Development is funded by Congress. Okay? And uh, almost 100% of all that we, of our aid is you have to buy American goods and services. That's a fact of life. So one of the issues that I had was the appropriate technology that was in introduced into the country, like uh, uh, the classic one is cold storage, high-tech cold storage centers for pomegranates and, and other fruits. Um, that was inappropriate uh, for, because it would, would not be maintained. I had always, uh, another one of my lessons learned was bring in consultants from India, uh, consultants from uh, other, de Thailand, other developing or de uh, developed countries with the medium type of appropriate technology rather than this high-tech stuff we had in America because that's what uh, would be sustained, uh, be more sustainable in the long term. And so I, uh, while I think there was some collective farming, most of it was all, all of the uh, inputs, millions of seed packets were given out to individual farmers and uh, that was a success. They, I mean, they, they, uh, they used them, they learned, you know, moving into using fertilizers, the good and the bad of that. Uh, but that was the emphasis of the U.S. development uh, aid. I think I better turn it over to Melissa. <laughs>
And so you wonder specifically, why do we consider ethical issues in biotechnology? And the reason is that this biotechnology is advancing very quickly now. And our, uh, we want to make decisions on whether or not to implement it or how to implement it based on uh, the expected outcomes. But the problem is, we really don't know what a lot of these outcomes are going to be. A lot of them we just can't predict. So, um, so we have to go with what we know. And let's take an example where we took in a biotechnology innovation that was a great idea. So in 1928, Alexander Fleming discovered, does anyone know what he discovered in 1928? Penicillin, <clears throat> right? And so since then, antibiotics have saved many lives and it's become a very useful tool in medicine. But at the same time, we've also developed antibiotic resistant bacteria. And this has become a real problem. There are people in the hospital right now who have an infection that we simply can't treat because the uh, um, bacteria is so strong. So, um, of course, we don't want to say that we should go back and not invent penicillin, right? But this is probably an outcome that we never anticipated. All right. So what I want to do is have you guys consider these three questions. Go ahead and just read them and think about them before I talk. And then, can you guys all read that? And then uh, in the end, I'm going to ask you these questions again and see if you've changed your mind at all about them. And we might not get to the bottom one. I have a little too much, uh, too much meat for my 20-minute presentation. So. Take your time. <laughs> no, they re everybody wants to hear about the Higgs boson. So. All right, everybody got these? <clears throat> all right, so I'm going to do a very brief overview of ethical um, theories. And I know any of you guys who are... Uh, philosophy majors will be sorely disappointed. Sorry. Sorry, James. <laughs> it's going to be really brief and basic. So uh, basically, there's two um, ethical theories, or they're divided into two basic theories. You have a teleological and a deontological. Um, teleological is consequentialist. That means you look at the outcome. That's what's most important. Um, and a utilitarian theory is basically teleological. The next one is a deontological, and this is non-consequentialist. It's based on honor and duty, um, focuses on doing the right thing regardless of the outcome. And um, this is where cons imperatives fall under, if you guys are familiar with that. And I have a slide on that. Thanks. All right. So I made this one fancy. All right. So under teleological, you have utilitarianism. You look for the greatest good for the greatest number of people. And individual rights are subservient to the greater good. And um, so I see a lot of my um, friends from the local community are here. So Japan tends to be considered a utilitarian society. On the other hand, you have um, the ontological, which follows cons um, imperatives. First of all, you should never take an action unless it can be a universal maxim. What that means is you should never do something if it wouldn't be right for everyone to do it. So if you're going to throw a piece of garbage on the ground, you're like, well, that's just one piece of garbage. But if everybody threw garbage on the ground, then it wouldn't be acceptable. And um, also, always treat humanity as an end and never only as a means. And this second one is very important for biotechnology because as it turns out, a lot of the practices in biotechnology involve using um, you know, people parts, parts of actual humans, to create the next uh, technology. So. And then finally, my favorite ethical um, theory is virtue ethics. And um, I like this one because you don't have a simple, you can't draw it out in a chart and come up with the right answer. For virtue ethics, you have to look at how not the action itself, but how the process of doing a certain action changes the moral character of the society. So um, for this one, I have a really controversial topic that fits perfectly, which is the death penalty. I don't want to talk about the death penalty. You know, I don't want to argue about that in class. But when you look at the death penalty, you might say, OK, if a person has murdered x number of people, then he deserves to 
be, um, be executed because one, we don't want him to murder any more people. Two, it sends a signal to others that you can't commit murder. So from a, a utilitarian standpoint, it's, that seems clearly acceptable. From a virtue ethics standpoint, though, we have to ask ourselves, how does the process or the act of actually a society deciding that we should execute this person, how does that change us as a society? The last, uh, last part of ethics, so these are actually uh, ideological, you have to recognize that. These are actually um, ideal, an ideological way to look at technology by um, considering the technical imperative. What this means is, do we have a choice as humanity as to whether or not we proceed with uh, current biotechnology? And so um, there's two, two ways to look at this, so you have the people who follow technical volunteerism, they believe that, that um, we do have a choice. So there might be some technology out there, but we as mankind, humankind, can decide whether or not to implement the technology, whether to proceed with it, we can control it. So these people are generally optimists. On the other hand, you have <clears throat> technical determinism. In this case, people believe that the technology will take on a life of its own once it's been discovered and you can't stop the progress of technology. And so these people are your science fiction writers. <laughs> so, um, all right, so that's all the ethics you get tonight. Except what we're gonna discuss the biotechnology issues separately. So the first uh, biotechnology issue I wanna talk about is cloning. And um, of course you guys know uh, who I have here. On the right, Dolly the Sheep, Dolly. you guys remember? <laughs> yeah, Dolly the Sheep. And on the left is uh, Arnold from the cloning movies. But anyway, uh, so in 1996, Dolly the Sheep was, was uh, the first clone created, first uh, animal clone. And the development of cloning since then has followed the uh, three phases of technical development, which is um, the first phase is where a new technology is discovered and it, it's publicized and it's a big deal and everybody's up in arms and people are polarized, right? The Dolly the Sheep people are like, oh, this is the beginning of the end of the world. We're all going to be clones. Or it's going to be um, clone wars, you know, and then you have the other side who's saying, oh, this is the um, next step to utopia now that we've discovered how to clone animals. And there's a big uh, amount of discussion, but then that's the first phase. Then that sort of fades away and it gets down to the scientists doing the actual boring science work of trying to develop an actual useful um, mechanism for this. And people kind of forget about it. And then when the cloning actually starts to happen, people who have basically forgotten about it, it's not really in the news anymore. But, so let's ask the first question then. So should you clone your pet? Why would you clone your pet? <laughs> right. So actually, if you want to, you can. <clears throat> but um, in 2008, an American company called uh, BioArts opened up for business to clone pets in America for $150,000. Now, they closed in 2009 for uh, financial reasons and also for ethical reasons that I'll talk about in a minute. But still today, if you really love uh, your dog, Muffy, or whatever, um, you can get him or her clone in North Korea, sorry, South Korea, I'm wrong Korea. Um, so Biotech or RNL, both are companies in South Korea that will clone your pet for a mere thirty to fifty thousand dollars. So anybody get the, their pet cloned? No. <laughs> so all right, aside from the fact that that is just ridiculous, when well, you can just go buy a top breed dog for a fraction of that cost, or go down to the pet kennel and get a dog for free, or cat, whatever. Aside from that, there's actually some other issues to be considered. So the first issue is that in order to clone any, um, any animal, you need an egg donor and a surrogate. So for an egg donor, you have to have some animals that basically are undergoing 
are having their eggs harvested. So female dogs that have to go through the therapy to create more eggs and then have their eggs harvested. And then you have the surrogate dogs that are basically just random um, implanted with, with the clones until they give birth to them. All right. And then the next issue goes to the fact that cloning is a very low success failure. So the little one is success, the big orange one is um, failure. So the statistic from the University of Utah is 0.1 to 3% success rate for clones. So that means for 1,000 tries, you have 970 to 999 failures. And now the failures may occur early on in the um, simply trying to create the uh, clone transferring the nucleus or during the, the cells might not divide or they might not implant but then there's also a large amount that are actually don't make it to term for the pregnancy. So I'm going to grab my notes here for a second. Okay. And then once the pet is actually, if a, an animal is actually born, you have still a high rate of abnormalities with the, pet, with the animals that are born. So there's a syndrome called large, um, Shoot, the syndrome name. LOS, large offspring syndrome. And so the animals are larger when they're born, and they'll also have larger, larger organs, like their lungs will be extra large, or their kidneys, or so on. And so this, the scientists haven't been able to predict when this will happen, first of all. And then secondly, they, sometimes they don't notice this until the animals much, uh, until the animals started to enter adulthood. So um, the reason that the one organization, BioArts, went out of business was partially because there were so many malformed um, animals born. Right. All right, so now let me ask you, so nobody wants to clone their pet, but what about bringing back extinct species? Do we actually have viable samples of extinct species? Well, yes. So. Um, of course, Jurassic Park is not, I'm not talking about Jurassic Park, that's not possible. <laughs> the uh, DNA is too old. But if you guys remember last year, Jill Roth gave a presentation, and she told us that we humans were probably responsible for the extinction of the woolly mammoth. And so there's actually, the technology is actually in place where we might be able to bring back the woolly mammoth, which I don't have a picture of the woolly mammoth, but what we have here is this goat which was a goat that lived in Spain. It was called the, I don't forget the, uh, Ducardo. And it was driven to extinction about 15 years ago. But the last one was, the last one was preserved. And so some scientists took the DNA from the last one and over time they implanted it in a modern goat and they almost, they actually did create the goat, but it didn't live very long. So um, I have my article, a part of the article to read to you guys because uh, to give you an impact or an image of what, of how it works. So the cells from the last surviving um, Bucardo cilia were preserved. And over time, this uh, physiologist injected the nuclei into goat eggs that were emptied from its own DNA. Then the, imp the eggs were implanted in surrogate mothers. After 57 implantations, <clears throat> only seven animals became pregnant. And of those seven, six ended in miscarriage. But one carried the goat to term. So the uh, scientists had a cesarean section and the, the infant goat was 4.5, or the clone, 4.5 pounds. And so, as the scientist held the newborn in his arms, he could see that she was struggling to take air, her, her tongue jutting grotesquely out of her mouth. Despite the efforts to help her breathe after a mere 10 minutes, Celia's clone died. A necropsy later revealed that one of her lungs had grown a gigantic extra lobe as solid as a piece of liver. There was nothing they could have done. So um, they're still considering trying to uh, bring this guilt back, but it's extinct, recent, recently extinct, but it's possible, so. So should we bring, uh, 
Yeah. What's that? What do you think about that? Because now I get to the, the big question. So, should we clone ourselves? Well, so uh, considering everything I talked about with animal cloning, we're probably not likely to want to do it. But um, some, some people think that it's a viable option for someone, people who can't have children, someone who wants to have children but doesn't want, maybe a single person who wants to have children, but doesn't want to go through the risk of having a donor or, um, you know, getting a, a sperm donor. And um, what about a family who has lost a child in an accident? So these are some considerations. I'm not, I'm sorry, I don't want to weigh my opinion one way or the other. These are the considerations that some people consider. But in 2005, the United Nations actually urged all member states to to pass legislation that prohibits cloning of humans because, as I said, um, it's in, incompatible with human dignity and the preservation of life. In the United States, there's actually no law prohibiting cloning. But there is a, uh, like, like my joke earlier about me being a writer, so there's a, a Dickie Wicker amendment that prohibits federal funding of any kind of cloning research for biotechnology. And then there's, um, many of the states have their own laws, like eight, um, there's eight states that actually prohibit human cloning, and there's uh, several that prohibit funding for it. There's actually uh, five states that actually allow state funding for embryonic research. So you guys can look up which states to see if that's your state or not. All right, so now that I said all this, let's um, take a moment and analyze the the concept of human cloning. So from a utilitarian standpoint, is it for the greater good to uh, clone humans? What do you guys think? So I think the only reason you'd ever want to really clone something is you said, lost a child, you can't replace your child. You'll have to weather on like all the other people do. Um, but if you could have, if somebody doesn't have the viable organs proper in their body, you'd have a spare body. I mean, they're probably brain dead anyways. That's the only reason I would even think of it. That's a reason. So, oh, go ahead. I read recently that there was an article where uh, scientists were actually able to see a memory being created in the process of it being created from a short-term memory to a long-term memory in the brain. So, you know, fast forward X number of years in the future, say you could harvest those memories and transplant them into the new clone. You know, and say you had a wonderful leader, world leader like, you know, Gandhi, Mother Teresa, etc. That, you know, that you respected the world, respected their opinion and their minds and etc. You know, would that be a viable reason? Mm -hmm. That is a good that's a good reason and actually that I was gonna try to think of somebody to bring up for uh, the con uh, the question with Kant, so if you can do it for one person, you should have to be able to do it for everyone. So I was going to pick an athlete, but you picked a good person. But if you, so from an ethical point of view, it's, it seems like a good idea, but we can't, as a society, if we clone one person, we should be able to, we should be able to clone everyone <coughs> from Kant's point of view. But, but what about from virtue ethics? So how would our society change if we did start cloning people. People are replaceable. People, well, people are replaceable, that's true. The world would become like the military. Everyone looks the same. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Oh, good. That's a good segue. That's a good segue to my next, uh, which I'm going to skip because I know I, I have a, I was going to talk about, I'll talk, I'll just say a bit about um, somatic cell nuclear transfer. So um, in this case, this is a, it's sort of, it's partial cloning, basically, but in this case, scientists have been able to take a, an oocyte, so a female egg, and uh, implant it with cells, somatic cells, which are basically your um, other organ tissue cells, and, and uh, grow human cells inside of the uh, oocyte. And so this is, scientists are looking at this as a great way to, to uh, create new organs or create 
extra tissues to help people who have diseases like cancer or so on. And so this, is, this seems like a great technology to replace if you've read about human embryonic stem cell therapy. But this uh, particular, the only issue, the main issue with this particular technology that I was going to bring up is that, of course, you have to, I talked earlier about harvesting dog eggs for, or animal eggs for the pets, so you would have to harvest human female eggs to, to carry out this therapy if, if, if it got to the point where pharmaceutical companies were actually running this as a therapy, then, then uh, unless we found a way to fabricate the eggs ourselves, we would probably end up with uh, a lot of women selling their eggs for science, which is, from a utilitarian standpoint, right, a woman sells her eggs to save many people who have cancer. That seems like the greatest good. From the Kant's imperative, though, we're using women as a means to an end, basically. It could be looked at either way. And the virtue ethics also found. All right, because uh, you are uh, talking about everyone looking the same, moved us right into uh, genetic engineering. And so, since the um, since the uh, human genome was sequenced in 2003. Immediately, like following those three technical phases, scientists were like, oh, pretty soon you'll be able to pick your baby's eye color and, and gender, right? But we still haven't come that far. So I divide the genetic engineering into two categories, which I, I created this myself, so it's not um, in a textbook or anything like that, but I divided them up between predictive and active. So Predictive genetic engineering is basically where you have your DNA analyzed and make a decision based on that. So, um, you know, parents can decide whether or not for uh, two people can decide for reproductive purposes whether their DNA would, um, would they have some sort of mutant gene that would create a problem for children. And then people can use genetical, genetic analysis to decide what kind of treatment to have. And then for active, there's a somatic gene therapy and uh, germline gene, gene therapy. So I thought this would wake everybody up. <laughs> <laughs> that was me um, like 10 years ago. <laughs> so um, of course you guys know who that is, right? Angelina Jolie. So she had, she had her DNA analyzed and found that she had the breast cancer gene. And so she had a double mas uh, mastectomy. But at a recent meeting of the um, Association for uh, Genomics, some of the scientists were actually talking about how a lot of people are having organs removed. They were referring to her based on these results. But actually, the science is not really that solid. And a lot of the positive results are false positives. But I'll see. I'll see, but that's not Angelina. Now this is a much better looking picture right here. <laughs> so uh, for, um, for active genetic engineering, the first type, this is actually happening right now, somatic cell th um, gene therapy. What happens is if a person's found to have a mutant gene that's associated with a certain disease, in some cases uh, scientists are finding these uh, mutant genes associated with disease on a regular basis now, regular for science. And um, what they can do is actually, using a um, adenovirus, they can actually send in a properly formed gene and, and actually cause the, your, gene, your uh, DNA to repair itself, basically. That's a basic description. So that seems like a good idea, right? And it is, no? Well, there are some risks associated with it. For one thing, science, some scientists worry that it can still lead to germline uh, genetic altering. And in this case, I'm going to talk more about your uh, germline in a minute. But So your germline is basically the, um, the actual DNA that you get from your mother and father. So you have a um, germ cell from your mom and one from your dad, and they contain, they contain the coding that turns out to be who you are. But if you alter the germline, you are actually alter, altering the DNA, not just for the child that's born next, but also for generations down the line. 
So there's the uh, oh, I got ahead of myself. I have a little more time. Okay. So uh, back to the somatic therapy, though. So there, as soon as uh, these uh, these genes started being discovered, the the um, industry starts getting interested for to tr for ways to make us superhuman, right? Because we all want to be uh, Kobe Bryant, who I could think of a good athlete. Um, <laughs> so uh, anyway, <clears throat> there was one gene that was found in the early 2000s to be associated with with the high levels of athleticism, and that was the ACTN3 gene. And this gene, everyone has two copies of it, but there's another gene that can mutate your copy. If you have one mutated copy, you'll still be fine athletically, but if you have two mutated copies, then you're going to be probably be slow and lack on athletic skills. So, like me, I have probably two, no, but I don't remember how my name was. But of course, as soon as this was discovered, some companies jumped right on that and they were like, oh, we'll analyze your DNA for you and tell you whether you're going to be a good athlete or not. But soon after the original study was published, the same scientists did more research and found that the gene's not really linked to making a person super athletic. It's not so much an athletic gene as it's a not slow gene. <laughs> <laughs> but nonetheless, as I have this link, I don't know. Then I'll have to go to questions pretty soon. But, well, I'm going to cancel it. But there's a company right now that, that advertises and is, has personal trainers set up so that they will test your DNA to tell you for a, a reasonable 10000 or so dollars to tell you whether you're a good athlete or not, when all you really needed to do was race your um, race somebody around the track to find out the same information. So I want to finish up with germline uh, gene therapy. So this is what I was talking about, where you actually go in and change the basic germ line. This has not been done in humans or large animals so far, but it has been done in small animals and plants. And basically, it's considered unethical to, to do at this time because, for one thing, you're changing the line that's going to go many descendants down. You can't make a decision today for people, you know, 10 generations from now. Secondly, it's just, it's just not well, it's just not well sorted out yet, so if they try to change a gene, they, it may or may not work. And what you may end up with is, say, three copies of the same gene and then, then uh, that can end up with lethal consequences for the, for the offspring. And also, some of the consequences don't turn up until later in adulthood. So what we might end up doing is thinking we're going to fix someone's um, you know, cross-eyedness, just trying to think of something. And, and what you end up doing is also causing them to develop cancer early in age, later in life. So, So, um, well, I was going to do the analysis, but I'll go ahead and I, I'm going to leave out nanotechnology and stop here and let you guys ask questions. So we can hear you guys. My voice kind of held up. Go ahead. Well, the study is based on species of uh, plants and animals that uh, have a, a much faster life cycle than, say, like humans or whatever. You know, so that way they can see 10 generations ahead of time within a, a span of uh, a few short years. Yes. And uh, a lot of the mammal studies are mostly done on mice. Of course, and um, there are several different uh, there are several different species that are that are very useful for these kind of studies because you can create many of their generations quickly and follow them through their uh, phases of life in a reasonable amount of time. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. I was wondering if you could touch on the uh, ethical issues of, of uh, say you know uh, companies patenting genes, saying oh. this gene is our intellectual property. Well, that, um, from an ethical standpoint, that definitely, uh, let's see, I'll go to the, I kind of left that one out on purpose. Actually, you know, in, in June, June 12, 2013, the Supreme Court ruled that it's illegal in the United States to patent a uh, human gene. So only, the only ones that can be patented uh, human-wise are synthetic genes. But obviously, the, uh, the, it's unethical. I would find it, let's look at the, when I got it. So um, utilitarian, obviously that's not for the greatest good because when a company does that, then it, then they can also charge money for people to 
um, to find out their own information. Also, the uh, patenting of the breast cancer gene was a real issue because then women couldn't go seek alternate therapies with other organizations. So, but that's actually the United States Supreme Court last June said that it's illegal in the United States to patent um, a human gene. Good question, though. So, that reminded me I was going to, there's the three questions. Again, did anybody change their opinion? No. So, um, because uh, I was asked, can we control our future? Do you guys think, who thinks that, who's our, who are our technical volunteerists? That we can change the future and stop the progress of biotechnology? One, there we go, one and two. <laughs> who are our brave new world people? Some are not committed. So um, this goes to your question. So actually, if you guys are ever uh, just wondering how cloning works, you can go to this University of Utah site, and they have this click and clone, and you can do a virtual little lab and uh, walk through a cloning of a mouse. <coughs> but um, any more questions? Where is it again? It's the University of Utah. <coughs> That's not suggestive that you feel like it. You see, I'm like, are you making fun of me? No. Nice. <laughs> you gave it to me. Oh, there's my <laughs> references. You know, because if you're in the UMUC graduate program, if you burp, you know, you got to reference it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's Turn it off. For so it'll be three, four minutes getting my um, very expensive and sophisticated lecture demonstration equipment in place. It's worth waiting for. <laughs> Bio 102 at 6 o'clock, we're going to meet across the hallway to 205. This is going to be at a high point. Uh, are they wrong? You'll find out. I'm not going to tell you what this is. This looks like this. Remember that we used it for last time? Alright, oh. Calgary. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, you remember the major steps, right? Well, the class is two. That's about all there is. I knew I got the right guy. No, no, no. Okay, we'll take about another 60 seconds of <coughs> continued break. <laughs> section. So we're just about ready now. A little bit more. Going in. 
So I'd like to start this discussion of what has been one of the major news items of the last year. And as I found out, um, it goes back a long way. It just didn't happen this last year. It had to start quite some time ago. So I'm going to sort of lead you through um, the development of this. And I'm going to do it in a way that hopefully will give you some understanding of what it is that this item called the Higgs boson actually is, why it's worth all the fuss, and what it means for the future. <laughs> As I speak to you, my throat muscles create energy and information and project them into the air field that's between us. And it propagates across the air field and into your receiving ear where the energy and information is converted back into the type that you understand. For this to happen, it's absolutely essential that the field of air be here. If we went into outer space and tried the same thing, it would not work, because the field of air must be there in order to transmit the energy that I put out across the distance to where you can receive it. Now, if I pick up this infrared remote control, then if I turn it on, then it will send out some energy and information that will be picked up by a field that is present in this very same room. And this field will propagate the energy and information into the receiving device where it will be converted back into the type of energy and information that the receiving device understands. Now, this particular field that's doing this transmission is quite a bit different than the air field. Because if we went out into outer space, <coughs> where the air is not there, where it's cold and dark, I went last night just to check it out, it was, <laughs> just as I described, this field is still there. Even in what we would expect to be an absolute vacuum, the vacuum is solid packed with this and other fields of the same type. So it continues to exist. So let's investigate just a little bit more what's happening between this device and that device up there. First, in this device, we simply have a long, thin wire. It's called the sending antenna. And in that wire, we have a negative charge which we have come to call the electron. Now, this negative charge vibrates up and down this wire with a certain frequency. Over in the receiving device, we have a similar long, thin wire. And let's say it has a plus charge on it. And let's call it a proton, just to be something that's familiar. Now, the plus charge and the minus charge are attractive. So they like to stay as close to each other as possible. So when this electron moves up to a higher location, this plus charge is no longer as close to it as it can be. So it scoots up to be as close to it as it can by moving to the location. As a result, when this electron goes up and down with a certain frequency, this one is following step. It also goes up and down with the same frequency. So what we have accomplished is transmission of information. Because we can use this frequency that we're sending, we can code it for any information that we want with different frequencies and transmit across this distance. And the same frequency will be picked up over here and decoded or deciphered. Now, in the case of acoustics, it's much simpler. Because if you want to do a high voice, you just do a high frequency. And a high frequency is picked up over here. But if you want to do a low voice, you just do a low voice, and the low frequency is transmitted over here. Now, the way that this happens is um, a bit of a mystery, because you now have to ask the question, how does this plus charge know that this minus charge moved? It's very far away, and there's nothing there that we've talked about yet 
So this minus charge moves, but how does this plus charge know that it moved? The answer is that there is actually something there. And that something there is what we call a field. The field is always present. And, <coughs> excuse me, this electron puts some energy and information into the field. And the field transmits it across the field, and this energy and information is taken out of the field by the proton. So you see, we don't have action at a distance or transmission across nothing. Everything is touching. The antenna is touching the field, it puts the energy and information into the field, and it's taken out of the other side. So this is the situation that we had in the middle of the 19th century. We had this description. I remember it well. <laughs> And this is the way it operated. At that time, we actually believed that this sending device could put in as little or as much or any amount of information into the field as it cared to. There was no restrictions on the amount of information that it could put in. And this receiving device could take out any amount or none or less than that or more than that that it wanted to. In other words, when information was taken out of the field, I warned you about my expensive lecture demonstration budget. This took most of it. When the information and energy was taken out of the field, it could be taken out in any amount whatsoever. Oh, so let's take this amount out. And a little bit later, or you just take a little bit out. Or you take as much out as you want to. There's no restriction on how much or how little you take out. And quite similarly, when you put it back in, you put in a lot or you put in a little. And this is the way that we thought the field operated. Then in the 1920s, we found out that we were horribly wrong. That when this sender puts information into the field, it can only put it in in a certain size chunk. In other words, we went from this to this. And we went from this type of universe into a Kleenex universe. And we didn't make this. We discovered it. Believe me, if we were designing it, we wouldn't have designed it this way. But in science, we don't design the universe, we discover it. So we don't really have a choice as to what it is. And what we discovered was that energy could be put into the field only in a certain size chunk. And you could not have half a chunk or one and a half chunk. You could only have multiples of that chunk one chunk, two chunks, or three chunks. Now, this is not so unfamiliar to you. I mean, if you want to add another member to your family, what's the chances of 1.78 additions? It's also done in chunks, agree? Mm -hmm. Or if I want to take a coin out of my pocket, assuming I got paid recently, then I'm only going to take out one, two, or three, or four coins. I'm not going to take out 1.4 coins. So this idea of things occurring in chunks is actually something that is not absolutely so foreign to us. But we were a bit surprised to find that it happened this way. Now, I don't see anything wrong with the word chunk. So you put a chunk of energy and information into the field, travels across the field, and the receiver takes out that chunk of information. But the technical word for it is quantum. So a quantum, or chunk, of energy and information is put into the field, travels across the field, and then is taken out on the other side. Now the plural for it, instead of chunks, is called quantum. And this particular field that I'm describing is one that's very, very familiar to you. I don't mean to make light of it, but you'll find out in a moment exactly what I mean. The field that is transferring energy between one electric charge and another electric charge is a field that is going on right now in this room. And I'll give you an example. <coughs> if this frequency of this electron going up and down is very, very slow, then it will generate a quantum that we call a radio quantum a radio quantum. 
if this frequency is quite low. And I suggest to you that this room right now is very full of these radio quantums. And if you want to confirm that, just turn on your radio. This room is absolutely full of it. And just to tell you some terminology now, these quantum, quanta that are produced by these moving charges are called photons. And the photon I've just described to you is the radio frequency photon. Now, there's very little frequent energy in the radio frequency photon. It doesn't hurt us. You don't feel hurt, but you know they're present in this room. Your wireless works off of them. But they have such low energy and low frequency that they don't much hurt us. If we want to up the frequency a little bit, then we have what we call a microwave photon, which is the same photon that your microwave oven works on. Now, if we want to up the frequency just a little bit more, then we come to the infrared photon, which is this machine operating also, the frequency just a little bit more. Now, the energy and frequency go up together. The higher the frequency, the more energy. The lower the frequency, the less energy. Now, just to give you an idea of just how slow this radio frequency is, this radio frequency only vibrates 100 million times a second. That's our slow frequency, 100 million times a second. Your microwave is already up to 10 billion times a second. That's a little bit faster. Now, if I go slightly higher in frequency and energy than the infrared, we come to a very special frequency known as the red frequency. And your eye can see it. We're now into red light. And if I go up a little bit higher, we get to orange light, yellow light, blue light, indigo light, and finally, violet light. Now, the frequency of these colors that we can see is one finished by 16 zeros times a second. That's the frequency of vibration. But these particular frequencies, your eye has a receptor that can see. So now you realize that the field I'm talking about is called the field of light. And the field of light is composed of photons all the way through it, different chunks. And each photon carries a certain amount of energy. Now, this field is, is, is characterized by the signature particle that can be put into it or taken out of it. So this field, as well as being called the field of light, is called the photon field. And the photon is a signature particle of this field. So the field is always there in the background. And if you want to transmit using this field, you put photons in it, and at the other end, you take photons out. Now, if we go to a higher frequency than violet, we come to ultraviolet, which our eye cannot see anymore. But some birds can see ultraviolet. And ultraviolet will actually burn your skin, as many of you go. No. If we go to an even higher frequency and higher energy, we come to x-rays, which can actually rearrange your chromosomes. And if we go to a highest energy of all, we come to a photon that's called the gamma photon. And it will damage your tissues and burn right through you. Fortunately, we don't have many of those high energy gamma photons in our everyday life. But what I've described so far is the most popular and powerful theory that we have in physics today. What we've done is put together our understanding of a field and the realization that energy can only go into and out of the field in discrete chunks called quantums, and we've developed quantum field theory, which you'll hear an awful lot about, and deservedly so, because it's the bedrock of physics as we have it right now. It's our most powerful theory, is quantum field theory. And in a nutshell, what it says is that the universe is full of fields, dozens, hundreds of them, some empty, some full, and every field has a signature particle. And the signature particle is the smallest unit that can be put into that field or taken out of that field, only in certain multiples. So you say, well, that's true, and does it work backwards? In other words, here we have an electron, which we've always described as a particle. Now that we understand that fields have particles, 
is the reverse also true? That every particle belongs to an underlying field? And the answer is yes. The electron is just one particle, the signature particle of its underlying field, which is called the electron field. And the electron field is chock full of electrons. And a few of them have come out of the field and they have a temporary presence in our universe. And these are the electrons. Now, if you want to put energy into the electron field, you can only do it in multiples of a single electron. That's the quantum of the electron field. You can put in one or two or three electrons, but you can't put in 1.7 or something like that. So they also ask the question, what about this proton? Now, you're somewhat familiar with protons, and you say, is a proton a signature particle of some underlying field? Well, let's for the moment, let's just say it is. And we'll look at that question a little bit more in a few moments. But right now, let's summarize the particles and their underlying fields that we have developed so far. We have the electron. We have the photon. And we have the proton. And I'm warning you already that there's something a little suspicious about the proton. Now, the electron has a charge, an electric charge, which we know to be minus 1. The proton has an electric charge, which we know to be plus 1. The pro proton has no charge at all. We know it to be a charge of 0. So you see, electric charges come in three types, minus, plus, or 0. Now, these three particles also have some mass. Now, I need to say what it is I mean by mass. Well, mass is the resistance to acceleration. The resistance to acceleration. This book, if it has mass, and I try to accelerate it, will resist being accelerated because it has mass, because that's what mass is. It's a form of energy, but it's a form of energy that has resistance to acceleration in both directions. First, it's hard to accelerate it up, and once it's going, it's also hard to apply negative acceleration and slow it down. And the more mass it has, the harder it is to accelerate it, the more resistance it has, and the more resistance it has to deceleration. Of course, the top example of this is your freight train. A long, massive freight train takes forever to get going, agree? Because it has so much mass, so much resistance to acceleration. And once it gets going, do you want to be in its way? It takes forever to stop it. Now, some of you may argue, well, what you're talking about is not really resistance to acceleration. It's just the friction between the table and the book or it's a friction between the freight train and its tracks. And I can give you a clearer example which will remove all of those possible doubts by taking you down to the bowling alley. Now, one of my New Year's resolutions, resolutions don't worry about bowling with me if you're competitive. I'm cannon fodder. <laughs> what I'm trying to do for the coming year is to interchange my bowling and golf scores. <laughs> but if I do go down to the bowling alley and I pick up a bowling ball and I try to do the correct thing with it, you will lower it until it's very close to the floor, agree? Just off the floor, and then you will stride forward. And as you accelerate that bowling ball, it's not touching the floor, agree? It's not supposed to. And you're also not raising it or lowering it. So you're not working against gravity in the slightest. So none of those reasons are the reasons why it's hard to accelerate that bowling ball. Why is it hard to accelerate that bowling ball? Because it has mass. And mass has resistance to acceleration. That's its nature. So because of that, then you cannot accelerate it easily, and you cannot decelerate it easily. Now, the mass of these particles is, doesn't much matter, what we call our unit mass. The reason it doesn't matter is, I hate to say this, well, might as well, truth is out, share it with you guys, 
stays in this room, though. We don't understand math, mass. We don't understand it. Um, I know that this object has a certain amount of mass, and I don't know what mass is, so I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> but I do know how to measure it, because I call this mass 1, arbitrarily. Now, if I put another one on top of it, how much mass do you think I now have? Two. Two. Okay. So what I measure is how much acceleration resistance a mass 1 has. Then I take some unknown object, and I measure its resistance. If its resistance is seven times as much as that one, then guess what mass I assign to this one? Seven. seven. So I never did understand what that was, but I know what seven times my ignorance is. <laughs> so we can just do these relative masses. So it doesn't matter what you call mass one, because you don't know what it is anyway. So oftentimes we call the mass of the proton one. And if the mass of the proton is one, then the mass of the electron is three zeros and a five. Much, much smaller, 200 times smaller. The electron is teeny. Okay. And the mass of the photon is zero. Now, what are some of you going to immediately see uh, startling fact. If the mass of the photon is zero, then that must mean that the photon has no resistance to acceleration. That the photon must have no existence to acceleration, resistance. And that's absolutely true. When a photon is created, it's created at full speed. If I go to the wall and I throw the light switch and the lights come on, all of the photons come out of the light bulb at full speed. They're created at full speed. They don't have to ramp up. They're going full speed when they are created because they have no mass. And that's a sign of a massless particle. Also, when they enter your eye and come to a stop, they're traveling full speed when they're stopped because that's a sign of a massless particle, no resistance to acceleration. Now, just what is that speed? Well, it's the speed of light. If I turn this flashlight on and aim it out the window, and let's suppose somehow this beam was able to go around the Earth and come back and hit me in the back. This beam of light, at the speed of light, would go around the Earth seven times in one second and then come back and hit me. So that's the speed of light, which is very, very quick. So we have developed these um, parameters of these particular chunks. Now, each one of these is a quantum of its underlying field. And these numbers that I put on the board are called quantum numbers. So each quantum has its own set of numbers that distinguishes that quantum from some other quantum. Now, there's a fourth quantum number that I'm going to mention at the moment, and it goes like this. All of these quanta are spinning. Every one of them are spinning. And let's say that the photon has a spin of one, then the electron is spinning half as fast, and the proton is also spinning half as fast. And there's another intriguing question that might jump out at you from those numbers under the photon, and it goes like this. The photon has a spin of one. Yes, the photon has a spin of one. Okay. But it has a mass of zero. So what's spinning? This is one of the intriguing questions that you're not allowed to ask. <laughs> However, I'm also very intrigued by it. So if you know, please tell me. If you have any idea at all, please tell me. Okay? So let's continue forward. And the next question that we want to ask is, is it possible that 
any of these particles could disappear and two other particles or some other particle appear in its place. Can we have the interchange of one particle gone from our universe back into the vacuum, back to its home field, and another particle appear in its place? Well, if we were designing the universe, we probably would not want to do that. It is a bit weird, but we did design it, and we have discovered that this happens. So we have to try and get some explanation for why it happens. So let's take a typical case. Suppose that we have one of these photons that's going along, and I'm going to draw its path as a wavy line because we know it vibrates. And suppose at some particular point, the photon ceases to exist, and out pops an electron. But that's only half of what pops out, because the electron has a sister particle. You didn't know electrons had sisters, I bet. And the sister particle looks just like the electron particle. It has a mass of 0.005, it has a spin of 1 half, but it has a charge of plus 1. So in all the quantum numbers except the charge, it's exactly the same, and so we called it a positron. And it is also known to exist. It's a sister particle of the electron. So what would come out of the disappearance of the photon would be one electron and one positron. And you say, well, I would never design a universe in which that happened. But let's see if it's at least possible. If the photon goes in, then what's the charge that's going in? How much? Zero. Zero. And what's the net charge coming out? Well, the electron has a minus one, agreed? Mm -hmm. And the positron plus one, which add to zero. So the charge balances. What about the spin? The photon goes in with a spin one, and the electron comes out with a spin half of that, and the positron comes out with a spin half of that, one half plus one half, one. So with the spin balance is also agreed. Mm -hmm. So it's starting to look like this might be possible. And now well, we ask the question, what about the mass? Well, the photon goes in with how much mass? Zero. But what comes out is twice 0 0.005, or 1 over 1,000. So where did that mass come from? Where did that mass come from? Why? <coughs> Albert Einstein told us where that mass comes from. What we have here, for those of you who weren't there, is an atomic bomb explosion. And the atomic bomb explosion releases an awful, awful lot of energy. We're not in any uncertainty about that. Now, the mechanism by which this energy is released is, as Albert Einstein told us, that mass and energy are different forms of the same. That mass is energy and energy is mass. That mass is frozen energy. And he demonstrated this about 30 years before bombs started being built, and it was proved many, many times over. That mass is frozen energy. Therefore, it can be melted, and the energy released, agreed? Mm -hmm. And that's what happens when a nuclear weapon goes off. A certain amount of mass is, is freed back to its original energy. Now, you have some idea of the amount of energy that's released there. It's 40 million pounds of dynamite. 40 million pounds of dynamite in that particular explosion. So you say, how much mass was destroyed in order for that to yield that amount of energy? Well, here I have a box of cough drops. Here I have a single cough drop. This single cough drop was the amount of mass that is, that created the atomic bomb. This much mass is all it took. A third of a cube of sugar, a coin out of your pocket, a large M&M, &M, they all have the amount of mass 
that when converted to pure energy, yields the amount of energy that is an atomic bomb. So the reverse is also true. If you want to condense energy down into mass, then how much energy does it take to create this much mass? An atomic bomb's worth, agree? Now, as you look around our universe, you see an awful lot of mass. You see galaxies, stars, super galaxies, planets, as far out as we can see, they're all there. But yet, in the very early universe, when the temperatures were very, very high, before the mass had frozen out, there was only energy, not yet mass. But if you look at the amount of mass that we have, then can you, it's incomprehensible, the amount of energy that it would have taken to freeze down and produce the amount of mass that we have. For example, this box right here is 10 atomic bombs. You are a thousand in your own body to create that mass is the energy of a thousand atomic bombs. I don't mean to give you a sense of power, but uh, <laughs> that is what it is. So there is an equivalence between energy and mass. So, uh, and we we'll go to an even larger one, the type that's been developed now, you see that we're getting into even larger ones. So, um, if this is true, then this photon does not need to have mass as long as it has sufficient amount of energy to be converted into the needed mass because of the mass energy equivalence. And that is how it happens. This photon does have an awful lot of energy. It's one of our highest energetic photons. It's a gamma photon. And it has sufficient energy that it can disappear and create these two massive particles. So how far can we push this equivalence of mass and energy? What I have here, for those of you that can't see, is a cup of water. Now what's going to happen if I push the pencil into the cup of water? I experience no resistance to penetration. Well, it's a lot, but I push hard because, you know, that can get it to happen. No resistance to penetration, agreed? Now here I have a cup of ice. And you say, well, ice is just water. Water is just ice. They're different forms of the same thing. You can melt ice and get water. You can freeze water and get ice. There's no difference between them. And I agree. They're different forms of the same thing. But yet they have a difference. If I push the pen into the ice, what is the resistance to penetration? It will not penetrate, agreed. So they're the same, but yet they're not the same. One can be converted to the other, but one has a property that the other does not have. And the same is true of energy and mass. Energy and mass can be converted to in, into each other, but one has a property that the other does not have, and that is that the mass has a resistance to acceleration, agreed? That the energy does not have. So that is the difference between mass and energy, that that does happen. Now I would uh, like to point out to you that since we have quantum fields instead of just particles, that what I have said, what just happens, is not what just happens. This photon came into our universe from the photon field. And when it sends a message to us that it would like to go back to the photon field, then we say to it, that's fine, but you have to leave your energy with us. So it says, OK. So it leaves its energy with us, and we have an energy broker who looks after this. The energy broker handles the energy, and he goes to the electron-positron field and says, I have enough energy to buy two of you. Can you send two of you from your field into our universe? And he says, give me the energy. You give him the energy, and it's done. So energy works amongst fields the same way that money works in our society. Energy is a currency. The same way that you can use money to buy things and sell things, we can use energy to buy particles from fields and to put them back into other fields. So it's not really an interaction among particles, it's an interaction among fields. And it's energy that is being used to have the transaction happen. Now the same thing could happen to you 
for example, if your friend had many cars and you wanted to use two of the cars, so you go to your friend and you say, let me use a couple of your cars. Well, because your friend knows you, he says, put up some collateral, the amount of money that the cars are worth. So you put up the amount of money that the cars are worth, and he gives you the cars, you use the cars for a while, check them back in, you get your money back, and then the deal is closed. So the broker takes care of the energy transaction, and it works. But there are often some legal rules that have to be met. And in the case of your friend, there might be a legal rule, for example, he requires you to have a license. And in the case of these energy transactions, there are also some legal rules that we have looked at, such as the charges have to add up, the spins have to add up, and there are a couple of other legal rules, like the momentum and other things that we haven't mentioned. But we have established now that these fields, these quantum fields, can interact with each other. Now, what I'd like to do is to visit the question that we asked. We had a suspicion about the proton. It was behaving very suspiciously. And we were not really sure it deserved to be in the same board with these other two fields. Because we posit the electron and the photon to be what we call elementary particles. That is, they don't have other particles hiding inside of them. They are not composite. But the proton, we're not absolutely sure about at all. So what we'd like to do is find out whether the proton is a fake elementary particle, whether it really is a particle, or whether it has other particles hiding inside of it. Now, in science, physics, when we want to decide what is inside a particle, we have a very elegant mechanism for doing that. So what I have down here is an ensemble of particles, all of which are held to be identical. And I want to ask the question, is this an elementary particle? Or are there other particles inside of it? And this is the way that we answer the question in physics. First, in this experiment, if there are other particles hiding inside of it, I want to be able to detect them. So I put my test particle in a particle detector courtesy of Siplock. <laughs> now that this particle is inside of a particle detector, which will trap any possible outgoing particles before they disperse throughout space, then I take another one. And I put it in its, don't try this at home. <laughs> I put it in its particle detector. And the next thing that I do is to get these two candidate particles whirling around in opposite circles at very, very high speed. And then I stop their high speed. And then I look at what I find. Sophisticated? Very. <laughs> That's how we do it. And I look, and it was a lie. I find other particles inside of it, right? So it was not an elementary particle. It was a composite particle. And this lying particle actually had two other particles inside of it, which you can easily distinguish. So you use the particle detector to detect what is, I mean was, it no longer is, what was in the particle that you're examining. But there's a, something called a decay lifetime. For example, we have about one week to examine these decay products before they, in turn, decay into something else that we actually don't want to examine by that point. So each one of these decay generations has a certain lifetime. And you have to examine your decay products before they also decay into something else, some kind of rotten mess in this particular case. So when we do an experiment, with real elementary particles, we have about one millionth or one thousandth of a second to look at them, the output, before it decays into some other second generation output. So these particle detectors are extremely sophisticated pieces of electronics. They're sometimes as big as a house in order to be able to do what they do. So indeed, we looked at a proton, and what we found when we played the same game with a proton, that is, bang one into another one and see what happens. 
course, the proton doesn't have a shell, so all we have to do is break the bonding energy of anything that's inside. And indeed, what we find inside are that there are three particles inside the proton. And these three particles turn out to be a new type of particle that we call a quark. <coughs> and when we classify, enumerate, and end up finding all the quarks that we can find, we find that we find this many different quarks, six of them. The, and they are truly elementary particles. They don't have anything hiding inside of them as of, as of 2014. <laughs> And we find six of them. And they have electric charges of plus or minus one third, or sometimes plus or minus two thirds in the variety. And they have masses that range from 0 0.002 up to about 200. So they have a large range of masses, and they all spins one half. So that is a complete list now of elementary particles. The proton was a fake, not really elementary at all, but still very, very useful. And our list of elementary particles is characterized by the electron, the photon, and the six quarks that we have now found. So now we have to go to 1964. In 1964, um, I had finished my first academic degree in philosophy, and I was doing what you usually, I had a job, uh, the job that you're usually able to get with a degree in philosophy, I was driving a taxi. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, taxi company really didn't want to give it to me without the PhD, but he was short at the time. <laughs> So I was driving around Boston in uh, 1964, and um, some other things were happening. There was a man named Higgs. And he posited some very unusual and special properties about a certain quantum field. He wrote it up, and he sent it to his editor. He complete with equations, a very sophisticated mathematical derivation of this brand new type of quantum field. Sent it off to the journal to be published by the editor. The editor sent it back to him with a comment of no apparent relevance to physics. Of no apparent relevance to physics. So what are you doing in this room? If that was of no apparent relevance for physics, then the guy got a Nobel Prize. Somebody was wrong. Well, Peter was a very strong personality. So what he did was he changed a few words and sent it to another paper where it was published and accepted. And um, what happened in between those two episodes were that two Belgian physicists also hit upon this by a completely independent mathematical derivation and sent it off also, and it was accepted. And then two months later, a team of three, two Americans and a Britisher, also developed it by a third computation and sent it off and they were all published. Now these are all famous right now, so let's look at one of these photos. Um, and these are a picture of five of them. Peter's not here, <coughs> but these two are the Belgians. Um, these two are Americans, and there's the Britisher over there. And these guys are very famous right now. In 1964, they weren't at all. And um, some of you wonder, what is it that motivates physics, physicists to do what they do? Well, they're not materialistic. And as you can tell, they don't, um, they're not particularly wardrobe conscious. <laughs> Uh, they're not really interested in that kind of life. What really drives them is fame, reputation, ego, glory, and recognition of their peers. It's a, they say they're not competitive, but they are. It's a highly competitive field, and they take a lot of pride in what they do. And these guys did a lot, and they deserve whatever accolades that they are actually getting. 
So we'll come back to them in a few moments. But for right now, it's back in 1964, and this simply was not being accepted. Now, in 1964, quantum field theory, excuse me, Melissa, quantum field theory was a stepchild. It was not popular. It was our third best explanation of elementary particles. It had lots of things wrong with it, and almost no one was working in it. But these five or six people, they had the intuition somehow that there might be gold there. So they continued to work in quantum field theory, and indeed they did find gold. So you can ask the question, did quantum field theory win because these guys went into it, or because of their talent level, would whatever they have gone into won? If they had gone into some other theory, they might have made that the winner too, given the talent level that they particularly have. But however it turned out, in 1964, this is the beginning of a very, very strange quantum field theory. Higgs postulated that there is one quantum field that is different from all other quantum fields. That in the early universe, this was the only quantum field that possessed positive energy. All the other fields, even though they were present, did not possess any energy whatsoever or any mass whatsoever and they all got their mass from this one father field. So it was a very strong postulate to put out there, but he had the mathematics to back it up. So what we're going to do right now is, um, is uh, go through, in a pictorial level, with zero equations, just what it is that makes that happen. So first I'd like to ask you a question. If I perform a physics experiment on this desk and I get to have a certain result, if I move the desk to the other end of the room, would you demand that I have the same result with the same experiment? Yes. Yes, you would want the results of physics to be translational invariant, agree? If I translate to another place, you would want the laws of physics to be the same. How about if I turn the table 90 degrees? Would you also want the laws of physics to be the same? So you would want them to be rotationally invariant. Now these are restrictions that we place on any physics that we develop. These certain types of invariances. Rotational, translational, and a few others. And in order to have some of the others supported, what we need to do is to have not just the Higgs field by itself, but it needs to have some helper fields, some help. Get ready, guys. It needs to have some help. Okay. Now, what I'm going to do is to create, right in this classroom, a Higgs field of two components. Now, if these two volunteers <laughs> could stand next to each other. Now, he's okay. <laughs> Not yet. Just right here. Now, what we have here is a two-component Higgs field. And you say, how can one field have two components? Well, in this room, we have a people field, do we not? And does not the people field in this room have a male component and a female component? So fields can have components. In fact, the Higgs field has this many components. Count them. Four. It is a four-component field. Well, you say, how can one entity have four components? Oh, come on now. The US military is one entity that has how many components? Five. Air Force. <laughs> I hate you. <laughs> the Air, U.S. entity without the Coast Guard, the U.S. military, has Air Force, Navy, Army, and Marines. Agreed? Now, every one of those is an independent component, autonomous to a certain degree, but they're all under the organizational direction of the U.S. military. Agreed? The same with the Higgs field. It can have four components, and it does have four components, but it's still just one field. Now, we're going to come back to our two-component Higgs field that we have right here. And what I have 
is a physical observable. In other words, the physical observable that I have is the difference between their heights. The difference between their heights is physically observable, is it not? Mm -hmm. Now, because it's physically observable, I would want that to be invariant. If I take these two people and translate them to the other end of the room, would you not want that height difference to be maintained? Yes. Now, if I turn them 90 degrees, would you not want that height difference to be maintained? So the important thing is that that height difference maintain an invariant state. Now, each one of these persons has a height to them. Now, could you gauge the height of this person? Could you gauge the height? Now, I've introduced a new word, gauge. And you know, using the word gauge in this sense, I mean measure, agreed? Sort of mentally measure without actually measuring it, sort of gauge it. What would you gauge the height of this person to be? Throw a number out there. Five, eight. Okay, done. Now, what would you gauge the height of companion to be? Five, four. Okay, now you have gauged their height, agreed? In other words, you have sort of measured their height. Now, we've measured their height with a zero point being at the bottom of their feet. So let's introduce that word that we've called gauge. And now what I'm going to do is to transform their heights. Now remember, the only thing that we can observe is the difference in their heights, right? That's a physical observable. And that must be invariant. So now, could we please up to up step? More expensive equipment from the snack room. Okay. Now, I have done what is called a gauge transformation. In other words, I have transformed their heights. Is this person any longer 5'8"? No. Is she any longer 5'4"? I have definitely done a gauge transformation. I've changed the measure of their heights, have I not? So this is a gauge transformation. And I've enacted it by using a helper. And that helper that I've used is called a gauge field. And what they're standing on is a gauge field. This is a gauge field. It may look like a coffee table. It's not. <laughs> it's a gauge field. And what I've done is not have them stand on the coffee table. I've made a gauge transformation. I've actually changed their height, agreed? What I've done is change the zero point. The zero point is no longer at the bottom of their feet. The zero point is now on the floor. So I've changed the gauge of what we're doing. But has the physical observable changed? No, the physical observable has not changed in the slightest. So you are free to make any gauge transformation that you want to your field because it will not change the physical observables. So you're free to do it if you want to maintain any invariances that's demanded by that. So you can add any constant amount that you want, and it doesn't change the physical observables, because most of the time what we observe in science is differences called derivatives, in case you know that word. So that is what we did. So. Now I want to remind you that you are very familiar with a gauge from personal experience because um, um, you guys want a cough drop? <laughs> um, because in your car, do you not have a fuel gauge? And does it not gauge the amount above the zero point of gas that you have? So the gauge is there for the purposes of gauging the amount of gas that is in your fuel tank. Now, a long, some time ago, uh, I had a vehicle called an elementary scooter. It was a very basic scooter, and it had a very basic gas tank on it. And it was so basic that it didn't have a fuel needle gauge on it. When the gas tank went dry, you stopped. <laughs> that was it. So the makers of this scooter realized that wasn't too popular with the owner. So they put a smaller little gas tank next to the big one that they called a reserve gas tank. And when the gas tank, main gas tank went dry, you turned the lever and you changed the zero point. And you went down into the reserve tank, agreed? 
and you kept on going. So this was a gauge transformation. Agreed, I changed the zero point of my gas content. And by changing the zero point, by, uh, I was able to maintain the invariance, and the invariance in this case is you wanted the motor to keep running. So I maintained the invariance, invariant quali quantity by making a gauge transformation. Now, what was the gauge field? The, the turning of that valve, agreed? I did the gauge field was what helped me to make the gauge transformation and to keep the invariance that I wanted. Now, this is fine for what we've described so far. It was sort of an introductory um, entry into these gauges because it's not the one that Peter needed. He needed, needs one that is just a little bit more specialized than that one. So what I have here, how much did this cost? Depends on what came in. <laughs> OK, I'm going to tell you what came in. This is going to actually crack you up. Uh, I live in Masawa Inn, and I've lived there five years. And I like it very much. And recently, they asked uh, us to change units. Something called deep cleaning. I don't know what they were implying. <laughs> so in the process of deep cleaning, I found this Christmas gift from my sister from five years ago. So that's where the box came from. Okay. Now, what I need to do here is to pretend that this is a security window. And it's going to maintain an invariant view of anybody that's coming in that door. And what I have here is a Higgs field. You say, wait a minute, that looks like a camera. That doesn't look like a Higgs field, OK? It looks like a camera, but this is really a Higgs field. And it has four components, as a Higgs field will. So can we count the four components? It has a lens. It has a CCD, which temporarily retains the image. And it has a memory card, which makes a more permanent copy of the image. And then it has a battery that runs the whole thing. So this indeed is a four-component device. And what we're going to do is call it to be a four-component Higgs field. Now, the invariance that I want to maintain on this four-component Higgs field is that it is always able to look through the window and to see anybody that's coming in the door. So I place this four-component Higgs field onto ground zero, the table, and I observe one certain problem. What is the problem that you are able to observe? They cannot see through the window. So we can handle that with a gauge field. See, so that looks like a flower pot. It's a gauge field. This is a gauge field. And if I use a helper gauge field with my Higgs field, then I can maintain the invariance. No matter where in the universe I move this gauge field, it can continue its invariant restriction of being able to look out of the security window, agreed? So this one gauge transformation that I've just made is good throughout the whole of space. So it's called a global gauge transformation. And the field that's making it is a global gauge field. So what we have is a global, global gauge transformation. Uh, go back. A global gauge transformation. <coughs> and it's doing the job just fine. Let's go to a slightly different universe where the bottom of the universe is not what that one was, but the bottom of the universe has this to it. Now I have my Higgs field, and I require it to be able to look out the security window, and of course it cannot. But if I put in my global helper field, that works fine here, but does it work here? Is it not too high now? It cannot see out the window. So my global field does not work in a space that has variation in it. So what you need is an adjustable uh, helper field, an adjustable uh, gauge field, and I happen to have one. This is my adjustable gauge field, 
that will give adjustable transformations to my Higgs field. Now what I'm going to do is couple my gauge field to my Higgs field. Now this gauge field that I've just added has three components. One, two, three. The Higgs field has four components, and I've coupled them together. Now that I've done that, observe what can be done. First, if I put it in this location, then it is now invariantly looking out the window at the correct height, agree? If I go to another location, then the gauge field is adjustable. So it can adjust to what is needed at the new location. And now is it not looking out the window also? If I go to another place in the universe, then I adjust it one more time. And is it not also now looking out the window again? So this is a gauge field that can be locally adjusted. It's called a local gauge field. And the transformation in height that it makes is different in different places. It's called a local gauge transformation. So now we have a local gauge field. Now, what happens next is hard to share with you. So get a good grip on the table and come along for the ride. In the early universe, <coughs> the temperatures were very, very high. The local gauge field was massless. It had no mass whatsoever. The Higgs field possessed positive energy. Now, the local gauge field, you might not have noticed this, but it has spin, agreed? You see the spin? So the local gauge field actually has a spin one. The Higgs field actually doesn't spin. It has a spin zero, for that matter. In the very early universe, the temperatures were so high that all of these fields kept to themselves. They didn't need any other fields. Then, as the universe expanded, the temperatures went down. And as the temperatures went down, they started to notice each other. And the Higgs field looked over in this general direction and said, wow, that's a cute little local gauge field over there. <laughs> and the nights got colder. And then Higgs made it. Higgs made it with a local gauge field. The nights got quite cold. The Higgs field spontaneously made it with a local gauge field. We use the term coupled. And as I showed you, it actually happened, agree? There was actually this coupling taking place. Now, remember, the Higgs field has four components. I don't want to get too graphic here. And the local gauge field has three receptors. So this is actually a very awesome coupling. And once it took place, there were immediately three children fields created. Three child fields came into existence. And um, they, were, they were the Walter field, the Wanda field, and the Zachary field. They were immediately created by this union between the Higgs field and the local gauge field. Now, these three child fields obtained some of the generic genetics from their mother, local gauge field, and some of the genetics from their father, the Higgs field. From their mother, they all got a spin one. All three children were spin one fields. From their father, they got degrees of mass. And this is where mass entered the universe, through this union with a positively energized Higgs field and an unenergized local gauge field, which was just supposed to be helping out. And look what happened to her. <laughs> and out of the union there came three. 
the Walter, Wanda, and Zachary child fields. And of course, each one of these child fields, as every other field does, has its signature particle. And we can write the quantum numbers of its signature particle. But first, about the amount of mass that was created. The amount of mass that's created, these two fields, the Higgs field, and by the way, she sort of dug him too. The Higgs field and the local gauge field, they had a certain attraction for each other. And when they coupled, it was with that amount of attraction. And that strength of their coupling is known as their coupling constant. And the amount of mass that their children has is directly determined by the coupling constant. A strong coupling constant creates very massive children. A weak one, not so massive. So Walter was created with 86, and I'm using proton masses as before. Wanda was created with 86 proton masses. Zachary was created with 97 proton masses. Now, Higgs did not have any interest at all in global gauge fields. I mean, everybody likes their own type, agreed? You know what we're talking about? It just wasn't for him. So he didn't like these local, these global gauge fields at all. And for reasons that we can look at in more detail in a moment. But still, one thing has not yet been taken care of. How many components did Higgs field have? And how many have been taken care of so far? Well, there's one component that did not find a receptor in the local gauge field. Higgs engaged in some sort of self-coupling and produced Higgs Jr. Higgs Jr. was his own creation, so therefore it all necessarily had what kind of spin? Zero just like himself. And this Higgs Jr. field like any other field, has its own signature particle, agreed? And this signature particle is called the Higgs particle, and it's the one that's causing all the excitement these days. It's a particle of the fourth child from Higgs and his girlfriend, the local gauge field. And it's the fourth child, the Higgs particle, and it was the one that is recently um, been talked about this last year to a very, very great extent. Now, let's investigate this development in a pictorial way. Let's suppose in the early universe, the temperatures are very, very high, which I'll illustrate by that graphic straight line. And here is the Higgs field sort of floating around on this little high temperature raft, enjoying solitary life at the high temperature. And here we have that cute little local gauge field. Here's the global gauge field, the one that he's not too turned on by. And over here, what we have is the electron field. Remember the electron field that we had early on? And next to it, we have the quark field. Now, all of these fields are massless. They don't have any mass at this point whatsoever because there's none in the universe. And all of these are what they are. And now what happens is that the walls of the universe start to move out. And as the walls of the universe move out, the temperature drops, agreed? Because the heat is over a larger volume. So the temperature starts to come down. So what I'm going to do is pictorially uh, say that this is a um, field of water instead of high temperature. So now the temperature starts to come down, the water starts to come down, and they all sink to the bottom, agreed? Now let's see what the bottom looks like. This is what the bottom looks like. It sort of goes along, it sort of goes along. And then here there's a large spike, and then it goes along some more. Now everybody sinks down to the bottom. And the local gauge field, she ends up down here, the global gauge field down here, and the um, electron field down here and the quark field down here. And they start to play around on the bottom with the zero point energy that they have. They have no energy now and they have no mass. But what happens to the poor Higgs field? He ends up right there on top of the mountain that was on the bottom. And now everybody has come down, so the top isn't here anymore. And this is where they find themselves. Now, Higgs looks around 
and he gets very, very terrified. Because wouldn't you, if you were up on top of a mountain, don't have large enough room for your two feet, nothing else? He looks around and he says, I'm fine as long as I don't sleep and I don't slip. But as soon as I slip, I'm going down the mountain. I'm in a very unstable state, agreed? So even though he ended up in a high energy state, notice he's the only one that has positive energy. All of the others don't have any energy at all. But he looks around himself in all directions. And everything looks the same in all directions, agreed? So he has what is known as global symmetry. And he says, I don't know how long I can last up here before I sleep or slip or something goes wrong and I go tumbling down. He says, this is a very unstable situation. And he just does the best he can. And to make matters weird, worse, worse, these fields down here that don't have any energy, they look up and they see him, king of the mountain, and they know he's got it. So without every zero point energy they can muster, they start to running up the mountain and call to him, Higgs me, Higgs me, come down, come down. <coughs> and he resists as long as he can. But ultimately, you know what happens, he slips. He slips and he starts to fall down the mountain. It was sort of spontaneous. It's what we call spontaneous symmetry breaking. Because now that he's falling down the mountain, are all directions the same? No, because in what behind him is the mountain, agreed? And all the other directions is not. So he's not in a totally global symmetry situation anymore. He has broken the symmetry and he's fallen down. But now we come into the reason of why he was afraid. Because as he's falling down, he's picking up energy, agreed? And he knows that if he continues to fall down to the bottom, he's going to have so much energy of motion that he's going to cause himself a lot of damage. And he can see it happen. And at the same time, these fields without energy continue to run up the mountain, attracted to him. And he sort of noticed them too. It was a mutual attraction. So finally, this local gauge field is somewhere up the mountain saying, me, me. And Peter does the only thing he can do. He realizes what he has to do at this point. If he hits the bottom with all of the energy that he has, it's all over for him. He's got to get rid of his energy somehow. Like a sinking ship has to get rid of ballast, agreed? So he comes down lighter. Now he knows what's going to happen if he couples with that local gauge field, because he knows the equations. He knows the equations. He knows if he couples with his local gauge field, he's going to produce children that have mass. And that mass is going to come from his energy. And that when he hits the bottom, he's not going to be traveling. He's going to land safely. So he does what he has to do. And doesn't mind it, actually. So he makes with the local gauge field. And immediately come out their three children, uh, Walter, Wanda, Zachary. <coughs> and of course, over here is Higgs Jr., just like before, out at this mating that now takes place at this point. And after the mating, these child fields, their signature particles have mass. The mass came from Higgs positive energy. He doesn't have it anymore, so he lands as light as a feather. So he had a happy ending to his trip down. The local gauge field feels a little bit fulfilled. The global gauge field is always asking, why not me? What was wrong with me? Well, what was wrong with the global gauge field, and Higgs knew it, was that if he had children with her, those children would not have any mass, because he knew the equations. So he knew that would not solve his problem. He had a problem. So instead of mating with a global gauge field and having massless children, he mated with a local gauge field and had children of mass and relieved himself of his positive energy. I didn't mean to use that word. And <laughs> therefore, he was able to land uh, without any difficulty. And Higgs Jr. came along because that was there. Now remember, these fields had masses, 86, 86, and 97. And now, the astute among you are going to ask a question that's been on your mind for the last several minutes. This mass is determined solely by the coupling constant, that is the amount of attraction between the Higgs field and the local gauge field. And that amount of attraction is only one number, one amount of attraction. 
So therefore, all three children should have the one same mass. I've spared you the worst. I've spared you the worst. Because you see now, in front of your own eyes, what must have happened. And in fact, it is exactly what happened. Higgs did not just mate with one local gauge field. There was another local gauge field. <laughs> I spared you the worst. But the truth is in the children. So the first local gauge field actually had only two receptors. And as we see, it produced twins. And the other local gauge field had one receptor and produced the Zachary child field. Now, which attraction actually is now represented as being the stronger attraction? Altawanda? Yeah, well, the Zachary turned out to be the stronger attraction. Higgs was not done yet. He was not done yet. After this, he calls over the electron field and gives the electron field mass. Then he calls over the quark field and gives the quark field mass. Then he's done. So this is how all of these fields gained mass. That he, Higgs fell off the mountain, realized he had to shed some energy, so he coupled with local gauge field, another local gauge field, produced three child fields, threw out his own sun, and then gave some energy, some masses to all the electrons and to all of the quarks as well. Now, when all of this was done, and this was all in the first 100 picoseconds of the universe, 100 picoseconds of the universe is when all of this happened. I saw it. <laughs> and then the universe expanded. And all of these fields, now populated with mass, went out into the universe. And they're still here today. And that's where our mass came from. From that first 100 picoseconds of the Higgs field coupling with these massless other fields. Now, these other particles of these signature fields, the Walter particle has a positive electric charge as well. So we call it W plus. The Wanda field of the same mass, because it's a twin to Walter, has a minus electric charge. And Zachary is, Zachary's neuter. He's got no electric charge. It's right in there, zero electric charge. Now, these were the predictions. These were the predictions of the Higgs mechanism. That's a, that's a nice word for it, isn't it? I mean, what would you call this activity? But a mechanism, agreed? So this, indeed, is the Higgs mechanism. And this is the Higgs field that partook of the mechanism, producing a child field called Higgs Jr. that produced the Higgs particle that we're all looking for. So these are the three ingredients. First, you have the Higgs field, then the Higgs mechanism, whereby it couples with gauge fields and produce child's fields. And then you have the Higgs particle itself that comes off at spin zero. So now the hunt is on. The year now goes up to 1972. And these masses have been predicted. These masses have theoretical predictions. But in the physics, theory is easy. Prediction is easy. What is the only measure of success in science? Really? Experiment. It has to be there. <coughs> Because we didn't design the universe. We can make our theories all day long. And 90% of them are going to get tossed out the window. But 1% of them are going to be confirmed by, the by experiment. And that's indeed what was going to happen in about 1972, was experiments needed to be formed to see if these signature particles could be found. Now, they only uh, exist um, if they are created for about um, a millionth of a second. So you're not going to see them. They don't hang around. So the only way you're going to be able to see if they actually exist is to create one yourself. 
and take a quick look before it disappears. So we actually have to create one ourselves. And so in the mid-70s, what we had to do was to create these particles and see if the quantum numbers were exactly what the theory predicted that they would be. And if they did, then we would have a strong stamp of approval for our theory of how all mass in the universe was created. So it was a very intense experimental uh, atmosphere in the 1970s to try to establish whether these particles existed or not. Well, how are you going to find a particle like this? If I give you an equivalent situation, suppose that somebody gives you a fleet of race cars, very expensive, high quality race cars, and you want to know what the race cars are made of. Well, there's two things you can do. One, you can get a toolkit and you can take them all apart. Or two, you can get a racetrack that's one mile across and you can put one car there and one car there and you have them go around and boom, and you see what comes out. And what comes out is what they were made of. And then you assume the others were identical and that's what they're made of too. Well, this is what we do with protons. We take a track that's one mile across and we put a proton here and a proton there and we go around at high speed and we hit them with each other and indeed what comes out are the three quarks that I told you would come out because we, that's how we found out that's what they were made of. So this one mile racetrack for protons works very well at seeing what protons are made of. But in the 1970s we raced these two protons are out and what came out was a W plus particle. And we observed it and we said, it's there. And right behind it came a W minus particle and the next day a Z zero particle. So we had complete confirmation that these particles existed. And the three physicists that had done the calculations for those three masses, they got the Nobel Prize for it. Now there's two things to talk about. First. The Higgs particle, for Higgs Jr., which was predicted to have a mass of 100 plus, a little uncertainty there, was not observed. Was not observed in the year 1976, when these other three were observed. It simply wasn't observed. And science was a little uncertain, because as soon as you see these three, you're sure the theory is right. And you say, where's the fourth? Why isn't the fourth one there? Maybe the theory is wrong. No, the theory is right. There wouldn't be three. No, maybe the theory is wrong. So there's a little uncertainty in the physics community because the fourth particle, the Higgs particle, has not yet been found. Now, someone needs to question. The mass of the proton is one. Here's another one that's a one. This mass that comes out is an 86. Now, how can you combine two masses of mass one and have a mass of 86 come out? Can I smash two eggs together and have an elephant come out? <laughs> Something much bigger than what is inside the eggs? Well, we saw it come out. So how did something that is uh, 40 times larger than the inputting particles get created by the inputted particles? Boom. Energy is mass, right? Mass is energy. So um, these protons, as they are accelerated around the racetrack, accumulate huge amounts of energy, huge amounts of energy of motion. And when they meet each other, all of that energy of motion comes to a stop, and it becomes available. And in comes the energy broker. And he looks at this huge amount of energy that's suddenly available, and he calls up the Walter Field and says, I've got enough energy to check out one of your particles. How about a deal? So the Walter Field checks out the quantum numbers. They're OK. So he sends out a W particle and accepts the energy as a temporary hold, collateral. Sooner or later, in 100 milliseconds, he's going to get it back and release the energy. So the W particle emerges into our universe because we have enough energy to pay off its field. And the energy comes from the energy of motion. So you can race particles around and create energy of motion and create particles that are bigger 
than the particles that you're racing around. Now the same is true with these race cars. If you race them around fast enough, what's going to come out of the collision is a Greyhound bus or a cruise ship because there's going to be enough energy available to create these. And it's a principle in physics in our universe that anything that can happen, if you wait long enough, will happen. So these things will come out. Now, um, this indeed was the situation in 1979, shall we say. Three of these particles had been observed, verified, and established. And Nobel Prizes had been awarded, but the Nobel Prizes had, did not go to any of these five because the Higgs particle had not yet been observed. And the Nobel Prize Committee is very conservative. And until they see that fourth particle, they're not going to award the Nobel Prize to the mathematical creators of this particle. Now, um, in 1957, Um, one of these five individuals in the picture that I just showed you uh, was my fraternity brother at MIT. <coughs> I was a freshman and he was a senior. And the power of this man's mind was awesome. You could just feel the strength of his intellect just by standing next to him. Now, we were all bright or we wouldn't have gotten into MIT. But he was very, very bright, and you could just feel it amongst him. But even though he was very, very bright, he was not very, very nice. He enjoyed his uniqueness. There was another senior in our fraternity who was very bright. Not very, very bright, but very bright. But he was very, very nice. Now, if one of us freshmen had a problem in physics and we wanted to understand what was going on, we went to the senior who was very, very nice. But if we just wanted the answer, we went to the guy who was very, very smart. Now, when doctors go to medical school, they receive training and counseling on how to handle a lot of the emotions that they're going to encounter later in their career, which indeed are a great many different kinds of emotions, as you can expect. And one of the particular trainings that they get is how to handle the emotions when their first patient dies. So even though the doctor receives this training, when he starts his practice, in a small part of himself he thinks, this isn't going to happen to me. I mean, other doctors have patients that die, but not me. That, that's going to, going to happen to me. And then when it happens for the first time, indeed, he realizes that even though he was trained in medical school on how to handle his emotions, he reports that um, nothing describes the moment. Nothing describes the moment. Now, us teachers, when we go through training to be teachers, we are counseled on how to handle the emotions that you're going to feel when you have your first student that's smarter than you. <laughs> and even though you receive that training, a little piece of you feels, that's not going to happen to me. There's not going to be any student that's smarter than me. And yet, teachers report that when it does happen to them, nothing can have described the moment. Um, in 1976, um, I was teaching physics at a college uh, near this one-mile racetrack. We have this one-mile racetrack that we race protons around. Now, it happens to be near Chicago. It's called Fermilab for people that want the name of it. And it's been there for a very long time. It's done a very fine job. It's a very high quality piece of machinery. And it is one mile across the middle. 
and the protons race around in a tunnel that's 20 meters under the ground. Now over in Europe, they built one that looks exactly like it. And this is called CERN, the Congress for European Research Nuclear. It's also one mile across, and it collides photons, just like ours does. Now, as a graduate student, I had done a little bit of work at ours near Chicago, so I was a little familiar with it. So when I had my class of college physics students, I took them down there for a field trip. And we toured through the facility, the underground tunnel and everything. That was very, very impressive. And we came up to the top, and uh, we noticed that there was a river that went around on the ground above the tunnel. It was a river of water. Above the ground, exactly on top of the tunnel, 20 meters down. And there were signs on the river, radioactive coolants, stay away. So apparently, this machinery under the ground that runs the protons around gets very hot. So they cool it off with water, and then they pump the water up to the surface to cool off. They take it back down for another cycle. But of course, there's a lot of radioactivity in these collisions. So there's radioactivity in the water. Now, one of my students um, was very bright. Remember, I'm only bright. <laughs> and he was also a champion swimmer at the college. So I put a physics question to him. How long would it take to swim around that radioactive river? Given that it's one mile across, and you swim three miles an hour, how long is it going to take you to swim around him? And he gave a very bright answer, the rest of your life. So what happened after that, and up until now, is that we had our one mile accelerator, and it was not producing the Higgs boson. And we realized it wasn't because it could not reach 100 units of mass energy. It wasn't big enough. It couldn't produce enough energy to turn into a Higgs boson. It was too small. So what we realized we needed was a larger one. So we designed a larger one, and we located the new site to be in Texas. Where else do you put things when you want them to be large? And we started construction on it. Now, of course, in Europe, they also started construction on their large one also. Theirs was 17 miles across, ours was 20 miles across. And construction proceeded. And now, the calendar time was now the early 90s, 1990s. And we were in economic straits. And Congress was needing to cut some budget. They needed to cut some programs. So they looked at this, which had only been one or two years into construction on a 20-year project, and they considered cutting it, because they needed to cut somewhere. And they were either going to cut this or military tuition assistance. <laughs> so they called in some physicists, and they said, what are you guys building this thing for anyway? And the physicists gave a certain death answer. He says, we're looking for the Higgs boson. Another elementary particle. He didn't, he should have said, we're looking for the God particle that creates all of mass in the universe. <laughs> but he did. He said, we're looking for the Higgs boson. Cancel. Project got canceled, okay? Because, um, and over in Europe, they said it right, and there's continued being funded. Now, um, I, many American scientists were very upset that ours got cut off and felt that it was a real loss that that happened. I happen to agree with this decision because when we only had the ones that were one mile across, those were the first ones that we were making. We didn't know how to do it. It was a very good idea to have duplication, get different angles on the same problems. But now we know how to do it. It's only a matter of making a bigger one. So I think one other planet is enough. This has nothing to do with the fact that it is military tuition assistance that puts food on my table. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually the way I feel. But anyway, what happened was that the one in CERN started to be built, and it took a certain long amount of time for it to be built, agreed? But in the year 2012, 
lo and behold, out pop the Higgs particle that they were looking for. Confirmed the theory, so the Nobel Prizes got awarded. Okay. So there we are. Uh, thanks very much for coming tonight. So we will accept questions if anybody's not too sleepy to actually have one. I really understand it that there are not because. I, I have, where, yes, ma'am. Where did Boson come along? Okay. Um, the boson. Um, <laughs> you're not allowed to ask. No, the boson comes along very simply. Um, we go back to some particles that have a spin one, like the photon. And we go to another particle like the electron that had a spin one half. And the proton also had a spin one half. Then we come to the Higgs particle that had a spin equal zero. Okay. Now, we have a particle has an integer number of spins, 0, 1, 2, or 3, or 4. It's called a boson. So as soon as it has a zero spin, it is a boson. These particles that have half integer spin are called fermions. Now, I'm so glad that you're walking out of here with some nomenclature. <laughs> because if one of you gets stopped a week from now and says, what did you take out of that talk? And he says, well, I got three of the leftover meatball subs. <laughs> Maybe a little bit more. So these particles of integer spin are called bosons. And if it has an integer spin of one, it's called a vector boson. And if it has an integer spin of zero, it's called a scalar boson. And the Higgs field that produces a scalar boson is called a scalar field. And the photon field that produces a vector boson as a signature particle is called a vector field. So that's the nomenclature. That's why it's called the Higgs boson, because it has an integer spin. It's called properly the Higgs scalar boson, because it has a zero spin. And the Higgs field is called a scalar field, because its signature particle has zero spin. So that nailed that down. All right. Okay. Yes, sir. Um, how many Higgs particles have we actually observed? Yes, that is the um, that is the next that is the next uh, area that needs to be looked at. Uh, I've described to you one Higgs particle that came out of the union of Higgs and two of his girlfriends. Okay? Then later on down the mountain, Higgs got it on with the electron field, right? So we would be looking at another Higgs Jr. of a different constant coupling, a different level of math, and another one with the quark field, agreed? So depending on the couplings that the Higgs field has, we could have any different number of actual Higgs particles. And so far, we have observed one, and all of this is theoretical anyway. And so there are there's some controversy as to whether there are other Higgs particles or not. It's not as firmly established as the one that we were looking for. But uh, there, are, uh, so there are proposals that there are other Higgs particles and that they are there to be looked for. So they would come out of different unions. And the other thing you can say is, if there were, didn't Higgs have brothers? I mean, why was he the only field in the universe to have positive energy? Maybe there was another one that did some coupling too, and maybe called Wiggs. And we're looking for Wiggs particles or something like that. So you know, once you have the mechanism in place, then there's no reason to restrict it to just one possible outcome. But that does lead us to an interesting question. And question is exactly the right word. Um, in science, the answer to a question is often another question. Here we have supposedly solved the question, where did the mass of the particles in our universe come from? And supposedly we have um, now answered that question, but now what we have to do is address the question, where did this mountain come from? It's the mountain that gave us the masses. But why was this, this spike of positive energy in the early universe? Why was that there? 
So you see, we've answered one question, and out of that answer came another question. And um, this was, how many of you have heard of Feynman? One of our top physicists of all time. He also had a great sense of humor. He was also a great lecturer presenter. And he gave a lecture one night in which he explained to his audience that the Earth was not held up by angels, but the Earth was held up by the gravity of the sun, which kept it in place. So he tried to explain that to his audience. And he thought he got it across. But at the end of the lecture, one indignant elderly lady stood up and says, that's nonsense. Yes? He says, yes. She said, yes. The Earth stays in place because it's on the back of a turtle. <laughs> oh, God. This girl. Well, he, he was not a newcomer at this game, so he knew how to, he enjoyed this rapport back and forth. So he, in total confidence, says, well, ma'am, and what's that turtle standing on? Well, that turtle's standing on another turtle. <laughs> well, he knew how to handle that, too. Yes, ma'am, and what's that one standing on, as if he got her there? Young man, she says, you're clever, but you're not going to get me. It's turtles all the way down. <laughs> and this is the story of science. This question that we've just answered lies on the back of another question. And that question lies on the back of another question. And it's questions all the way down. So that's science. OK, okay others, questions? <laughs> OK, we'll stop now. Thanks very much for our Okay, we're done. So, a photo on the uh, spine or, has to be aligned. We get out of a cab, and the baggage handler comes up and says, Do you need help with your bags? And the photo says, No, I'm traveling light. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, would you like to try it? Don't, like, the look for you is just not lifted enough. Are there a lifted enough? I didn't lift it enough. Yeah. <laughs>